Hello everybody, I'm Poet and I have an interview with the President of the Oscar Wilde Society, Mr Giles Randall. Well hello Poet, it's exciting to be with you. We are speaking to your audience, people who are intrigued by Oscar Wilde and Arthur Ransom, from uh, what was a railway station. We're here at something called The Platform in Morecambe. So I'm here in Morecambe because I'm doing some warm-ups for a show that I'm taking to Edinburgh, to the Edinburgh Fringe for the whole of August. It's called Break a Leg, and it's about all things theatrical. And Oscar Wilde features in it, but not as yet Arthur Ransom. Can I say, I don't know if, if the, the, this is being included in the shots, but this lovely green velour here, it's the sort of thing that Oscar would have enjoyed. That's I don't nice. think he yes. would have improved no. of the, the, the paper cups. But the message, I'm a green cup, he would have been, would have approved of because he liked the colour green. So, far away, what are we going to talk about? I'd like to know, first of all, what are your impressions of Morecambe? I love Morecambe. And it's a part of the world I love to come to because my forebears all came from this part of the world. My mother's family came from Accrington, which is in Lancashire. My father's family, well, my father was born in Hoylake on the Widdle, not that far from here. And I was the Member of Parliament for the city of Chester, which is again not that far from here. What's intriguing to me is that my great, great, great grandfather was somebody who went to America in the 1830s and made a major fortune. I mean, millions, multi-millions, what would now be called billions of dollars selling Brandreth's pills. And he was very famous in Victorian times in America. Brandreth's pills feature in literature. They come up in Moby Dick, for example. And he made a major, major fortune selling these pills to everyone in America, and they solve whatever problem you have. You know, uh, heart disease, take a Brandreth's pill. Headache, take a Brandreth's mm -hmm. pill. Uh, want a baby, take a Brandreth's pill. Don't want a baby, take a Brandreth's pill. Okay. And he made a great fortune in America, ended up as a New York State Senator, became a friend of P.T. Barnum. In fact, who wrote a chapter in his book about humbug, about people who managed to, uh, well, who managed to make a fortune out of humbug. He wrote a chapter about my forebear, doctor, so-called, Benjamin Brandreth. Well, Dr. Brandreth had lots of children, and one of them was sent back to this part of the world in the late Victorian age, the 1880s, 1890s, and that's when this part of the world was hugely prosperous. And I like this part of the world, too, because I'm a patron of the National Peers Society, uh, those wooden things that go out into the sea, and uh, pleasure domes often built on the end, fun fairs, and or you can just walk along them and, with your ice cream. Yes. So I love being in this part of the world because there are lots of peers around here. So I'm happy to be in Morecambe. And if you are, for example, Dr. Peach, watching this, wherever you live, Doctor, come over to the UK and come up to Lancashire. It's a sort of hidden gem, and the people, there's always a warm welcome. Um, how did you become the president of the Oscar Wilde Society? I imagine everybody else said no. That's not true. I am the first president. Uh, and I was one of the um, patrons. There's some very distinguished patrons, including Merlin Holland, the only grandson um, of Oscar Wilde. Others include the president of Magdalen College, Oxford, which is where Oscar Wilde was educated when he came over from Ireland to live in England. Uh, Stephen Fry, writer, actor, filmmaker. So a lot of patrons. And um, a couple of years ago, because I've been writing murder mysteries featuring Oscar Wilde as my detective. The committee running the society thought the murder mystery element is my inventive element, but alongside it is really what is a serial biography of Oscar Wilde. So I've learned a great deal about him. So I do know a lot about Oscar Wilde. And they thought he lives in London, which is where the society is based. He travels a lot around the United Kingdom, he even goes to America. Let's ask him if he'll be our president. So I was honored. And it's good to celebrate Oscar Wilde, the most fascinating character, and the man who wrote The Importance of Being Earnest, which I would argue is the best, finest play written in Victorian times in the English language. What can people gain through joining the Oscar Wilde Society? Oh, what can they gain? They gain a, a key to a door that opens into an extraordinary world and you join the great Victorians. You, you, 
You join in the most extraordinary world. What's fascinating about Oscar Wilde, and one of the reasons that I thought he'd make a good detective in my murder mysteries, is that he knew everybody, from literally you know, the Prince of Wales to common prostitutes. When he went to America for his two big tours in America, he meant his business to meet everybody, from P.T. Barnum, the great circus owner, through to Walt Whitman, the great poet. He knew everybody. People were fascinated by him because of his extraordinary way with words. They liked his company. And so it's the closest you're going to get to Wilde's world. So if you want to walk on the wild side, meet him and the people he knew, you've got to join the society. It has a scholarly magazine called The Wildian, which comes out regularly and is, you know, if you are doing Victorian studies, literature studies, gay studies, uh, drama studies, you need to have the wild in. So the way to get it is to join the Oscar Wilde Society. It's as simple as that. But it also has Intentions, which is a, a lighter journal. It has a, a regular um, e-journal now that comes out on a regular basis. So if you want news, gossip about what's going on in the wild world, want to know about productions happening all over the globe, movies, example, the recent uh, movie, uh, directed, produced, written, and starring Rupert Everett, you have to get it to the Oscar Wilde Society. It's run by civilized people, intelligent, civilized people. How would you like the Oscar Wilde Society to develop? Would you like a magazine to have a magazine for juniors, like the Arthur Ransom Society, Ooh. with family events? Ooh, what a good idea, because Oscar Wilde did write for children. He had his own children, and he entertained children. He was a very amusing person. Uh, and, of course, famously, when he was in exile, just in case your viewers are not aware of this, in 1895, Oscar Wilde was imprisoned for gross indecency for two years. When he emerged, so great was the scandal that he had to leave England and lived in France till he died in Paris in 1900. But uh, when he was released from prison, it coincided with the, um, one of the jubilees of Queen Victoria, and he held a party for the children in northern France, where he was living, and great fun was had. So he was good at entertaining children. He enjoyed entertaining children. And of course, he wrote fairy stories for children. So your idea is intriguing. Why not? We can, get, we can develop anything. I mean, at the moment, it isn't particularly for children, though we might well have some young people who are members. I don't know. At the moment, it really is for people who are just interested in the wild phenomenon, scholarship, and news of events. But why not little wildians? Little wild ones? Yes. <laughs> Weenie Oscars, <laughs> absolutely. And maybe it should be named after Cyril and Vivian, his two sons. Who knows? Yeah, we've started something there, poet. Where did the inspiration for your Oscar Wilde murder mysteries come from? Reading the biography of Arthur Conan Doyle, the autobiography of Arthur Conan Doyle. Quite early on in the book, I, I came across this description of a dinner that uh, Arthur Conan Doyle had had when he was quite young, in his late 20s when an American publisher wanted, was looking for writers in England to write murder mysteries for his magazine, Lippincott's magazine. And at this dinner was Oscar Wilde, who was then in his uh, early 30s, Arthur Conan Doyle, and they met for the first time at the Langham Hotel in London, and they clearly hit it off. And um, Arthur Conan Doyle writes about this very movingly in his book, uh, about what a golden evening it was, and how he was bowled over by the charm Oscar Wilde. And seeing that they had this good relationship, but thinking what unlikely pair they were, uh, that these two unlikely figures got on so well intrigued me. And as a result of that dinner, Oscar Wilde was persuaded what became um, the picture of Dorian Gray, and Arthur Conan Doyle was persuaded to write the second of the Sherlock Holmes stories. So it was a pivotal evening. And in fact, if you are coming over from America, or wherever you come from, and find yourself in London, go to the Langham Hotel, you can see the plaque that I unveiled marking this. So that dinner, the friendship between Arthur Conan Doyle and Oscar Wilde, inspired my seven books published in 20 countries around the world. It's wonderful. Yeah, it is yeah. wonderful. So please, if you've got this far and you're watching this and you think, no, I might read this. Oh, what's, this? what's that guy's name? What's he called? It's Giles, which a lot of people in America don't have, knows the name. You know, they, they used to say Giles. G-Y-L-E-S for sugar, Brandreth, B-R-A-N-D-R-E-T-H. Are they going to be turned into a TV series for an international audience? I hope one day. I'm waiting for the call from Netflix. Wanted anybody else? 
In fact, there have been options. Stephen Fry, who is a friend of mine and a marvellous person, uh, he optioned them, hoping to make them into a television series when they first began coming out ten years ago. And that didn't go anywhere. These things often don't. Um, and I think they're about to be optioned again. So who knows? Uh, I've written them. They're out there. The last one, the first one's called Oscar Wilde and the Candlelight Murders. And the last one, the seventh in the series, is called Jack the Ripper, Case Closed. I have solved the mystery of Jack the Ripper, or rather I've allowed Oscar Wilde and other Conan Doyle to do so. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so with, with these books that you've got, do you think that you will be the man who has made wild in the 21st century? Well, I hope my books are two things. I hope, first of all, they are fun murder mysteries. If you like traditional English murder mysteries in the tradition of Agatha Christie, Dorothy L. Sayers, then you'll enjoy these. They're historical murder mysteries set in London, in Paris, in America, uh, in the 1880s, 1890s. And one of them, in fact, is set in the 1870s. It begins there because Oscar Wilde met one of the popes, Pope Pius IX. Oscar Wilde met a pope. Isn't that amazing? So all these, everything in it is true. So if you enjoy historical murder mystery, you could enjoy these books, and I hope you'll give them a go. But also, what I like to think is that they're a fun way of meeting Oscar Wilde and his world. Because not only do you meet Oscar, but you meet the people he knew. Bram Stoker, great actor Sir Henry Irving. Uh, these are characters, the young J.M. Barry. They all appear. I mean, the way to get to know Wilde is to read his work, first of all, and then to read his letters collected by his grandson, uh, Merlin Holland. And then, I hope, uh, to read the Oscar Wilde murder mysteries, starting with Oscar Wilde and the Candlelight Murders, and discover his story with the fun, the extra fun, of a murder mystery added on. Because as Oscar said, there's nothing quite like an unexpected death for lifting the spirits. If you want to get into Wilde the Poet, I would recommend one poem in particular. Everyone knows the Ballad of Reading Jail, and it's wonderful. But there's a poem, a sonnet, I think it's called On, on the Sale of Keats's Letters at Auction. I'm summarizing the title. And it's, it's a wonderful poem. So if you want to read one poem, On the Sale of Keats's Letters by Oscar Wilde, it's only 14 lines, it's a sonnet, and I think you will be impressed. Okay, where were we? Now, one thing that Wilde had in common with Arthur Ransom is a love of sailing in the sea. Have you any new stories about this aspect of Wilde? Hello, sailor. Well, this is a new dimension of Wilde. I never think of him particularly as a nautical fellow. I mean, I know he enjoyed going on, walking on the beach to an extent, uh, and there's some marvellous accounts of him in Worthing uh, enjoying the seaside. Uh, and he was unexpectedly physical. People think of him as an East thief, but of course he was a, a big man and he was a strong person and he was useful with his fists, which came, which was a benefit to him on more than one occasion. And I know he played golf, which people don't think of, Oscar Wilde playing golf. Can you imagine him and Donald Trump doing a round of golf together? That would be hilarious. They're probably physically of a similar sort of frame. Uh, and I think Oscar Wilde would have found Twitter quite a challenge little pithy remarks. But tell me more about the sailing. Um, in one of his letters, um, he spoke, he, there, there was a high wind, and it was quite dangerous on the waves. And when these boys got back to the hotel, they had a hock and seltzer, I think it was. Oh, yeah. And he said, I was Olympian quite. And it sounds as though he knew what he was doing, and he enjoyed the adventure of being on the way. Well, so that sounds like ransom. That's charmingly put, if I may say so. And I yes. think that's lovely to see it, uh, poet, with your Arthur Ransom spectacles on. I suspect that the boys you mentioned and the prospect of the Hock and Seltzer after were as alluring to him as being on the boat and the briny. That's my, that's my instinct. Um, so. Um, but why not, Combine, combining all the pleasures? Yeats also mentioned that about, he, he also had a memory of, of Wilde and in a boat with his boys, his own children. Well, I think he enjoyed the company of children and oh, yeah. was, was good company, so, um, but I, I don't know that, you may, this, this you should possibly be writing a piece for the Wilde Union. 
on this poet, there should be, you should be doing some scholarly work. Actually, Oscar Wilde, the sailor. I mean, I think, <laughs> or indeed, hello sailor, the yeah. unknown Oscar Wilde. Because uh, we've got a sense of humor. We're allowed to laugh at these things. You know, even though it's high literature, we can, um, we can be amusing now and again. Do you love sailing? Oh. Well, of course, I know we're celebrating Arthur Ransom. I'm the wrong person to ask. Okay. Well, not, I'm the right person to ask, because I'm the president of the Oscar Wilde Society. Um, but I'm the wrong person to ask if you're wanting jolly, nautical, or even <laughs> sailing memories of any kind. The idea of being on a boat is anathema to me. I don't mind reading about these things. I love the world of Arthur Ransom. I love the world of um, that evocative Edwardian world of people like Kenneth Graham or A. A. Milne. And indeed, Jerome K. Jerome. I think I'm a patron of the Jerome K. Jerome Society. So messing about in boats is a fun idea to me. In theory, to read about, to do, I can imagine nothing worse. The horror of a rowing boat, oh, you know, chocks away, or what are they called, rollocks away. Ooh, ghastly. Occasionally I'm obliged, because I make television programs here, to do filming in a rowing boat. I only will do it if it's attached by ropes at either end. There are people in nautical kit ready to rescue me. I've been offered cruise ships all over the world. I could go anywhere in the world to give lectures about Oscar Wilde and other things for free as a guest. Anywhere in the world, any cruise ship, I will say no. Who wants to be out at sea? Oh, oh. I've seen Titanic. I know what happens. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I have been on some beautiful cruises. It must be said, river cruises. Uh, and I have been, I have been on some wonderful, wonderful river cruises. I don't mind having a toy yacht <laughs> in Kensington Gardens. Um, you know, like J.M. Barry with the Lost Boys from Peter Pan. I don't mind setting a, a toy yacht a, a, across. That, that's fine. But I'm not going sailing with Arthur no. Ransom or anybody else. Not even with you, poet. <laughs> no. Thank you. It'll be man overboard. Don't try and get me onto it. <laughs> if you were to sum up Wilde, what would you say? What would you say about his personality? Well, what's so delightful about Wilde is he's difficult to sum up. Uh, but curiously, he used to believe that um, to be remembered, you just needed a name with five letters in it. Uh, and he gave oh. us an example like, well, Oscar or Giles, or indeed, you know, Plato or Jesus. Yeah. Or as he said when he met the elephant at P.T. Barnum Zoo, Jumbo. And he said, a hundred years after my death, my enemies will call me wild and my friends will call me Oscar. So I think actually his name sums up the multiplicity of his genius. He was a poet, he was a wit, and his story, tragic and fascinating, still grips us. So I'm gripped by Oscar Wilde. I'm very proud to be the president. I'm not worthy of it. I appreciate that. Um, but I do have something to offer that not many people can offer. I was at a school uh, that was founded by a man called John Baddeley who knew Oscar Wilde, indeed Oscar Wilde's eldest son, Cyril, went to this school. So I have met a man who met, indeed knew, and was a friend of Oscar Wilde. So when you shake my hand, you're shaking the hand that shook the hand, that <laughs> shook the hand that wrote the importance of being earnest. If that doesn't qualify me to be the president, what does? In fact, since I'm calling you Pert, maybe you should call me president. So thank you, Pert, for your company. You now say thank you, president. Thank you. Mr. Giles. No, Man. no, no. Thank you, President. We're on per president terms now. Thank you. Thank you, poet. President. President. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, President. Thank you, Poet. Oscar, wouldn't it be fun if you walked in now? 